Hey everybody, welcome to AIT 2101, Predictive and Preventive Maintenance. Uh, and today we are going to be going through a series of vibration analysis lecture videos. Okay, I'm going to break these videos down into small chunks um, for several reasons. Number one, uh, it's easier for me in terms of uploading them into Blackboard, mashing them up and everything. And it's also going to be better for you because we can take it section at a time and it gives you a chance to digest the information a little bit. And if you've got questions or anything, you can tell me, hey, I've got, I got problems with lecture number one or I'm not some, understanding some stuff in lecture two or whatever the case may be. So it kind of works both uh, well for both of us. But anyway, we're going to get started. And remember, vibration analysis is just one tool, one predictive maintenance tool in our toolbox. Uh, we also use these in concert, or vibration analysis in concert with uh, uh, thermography uh, and also oil analysis and also to some degree um, ultrasonic detection as well. Not so, we don't get into that very much in this class, but we are going to delve into vibration analysis and I'm going to go ahead and get moving into that. Okay? So first of all, what is vibration and why do we even care? Okay? Well, first of all, let's, let's, let's go ahead and define it. Okay? Vibration is any motion that repeats itself. Uh, over an interval of time, okay? And by that we mean it's a cyclical or oscillation motion of a machine or machine component from its point of rest, okay? Uh, probably when you think about oscillating, you think about oscillating fans, a fan that, you know, a room fan that oscillates back and forth. It's the cyclical motion from one point to the, to the uh, far extreme on the other end, and you've got that point in the middle that we consider its point of rest, okay? Um, I use this as an example. I've got a uh, hacksaw blade, okay? And I flip this and we see some vibration and we are watching that blade oscillate from one extreme to the other and here's its point of rest, okay? Just give you a simple reference to go to, uh, uh, to, to take a look at, okay? And I've got a couple of graphics here. Here's some I-beams that are oscillating or vibrating, okay? And here they are, this one, uh, longitudinal here. This has got a twisting torsion motion right here. But they are cyclical in their motion. They're rocking back and forth. And that is ba the very basis of uh, vibration, okay? Now, you see this one, it's repeating itself. And again, like I said, this one is oscillating. Now, when we have vibration, there are four forces at play, okay? We're going to cover each one of those. The first one we call an excitation force. That is the force that gets the vibration going, okay? Uh, let's use the simple example of a, uh, your, a heavy spot on one of your uh, tires in your car or truck, okay? If you have a heavy spot, it's, it's out of balance. We have an imbalance, and that heavy spot is creating the vibration. It is the excitation uh, of, that, of that vibration force, okay? It contributes to the vibration. It's what causes the vibration. Okay? And we have three other forces that are in play as well. And these are the opposing forces that oppose the excitation force, okay? the actual vibration itself, I should say. Okay, so we have mass and stiffness and dampening. These are the opposing forces that oppose uh, vibration in and of itself. Okay? So we're going to take a look at each one of these. For example, uh, the excitation force. Okay? Whenever we strike an object, Whatever puts that uh, motion, object in motion, that's our excitation force. If I take the saw blade, like we were looking at earlier, and I strike that, that is the excitation force, and it causes that vibration, okay? It causes that oscillation motion. That is the excitation force. Now, like I told you earlier, in your uh, car or truck tire example, it could be a result of being out of balance, okay? You could have a heavy spot in that tire, and it just bump, bump, bump going down the road, and the faster you drive, the, the more uh, often that uh, thumping goes, that's, that's the frequency of that vibration, okay? It's impacted by the speed. But my point is, is that you've got imbalance and that is causing the vibration. Other things that can cause vibration as well is misalignment. A lot of times you'll have a, a three-phase electric motor coupled to a pump and if they are not perfectly aligned or very, very closely aligned, I should say, you're going to get some misalignment with an angular, uh, you know, from, from, or from an elevation or horizontal. You know, it's going to get some misalignment there, and it's going to cause that coupling to kind of just butt heads like this instead of rolling smoothly. It's, they're going to kind of be butt heads. So that's going to set up a vibration, too, and that's as a result of misalignment. And there are, we're going to be covering a lot of sources of vibration in this class, but um, the, the one force that gets everything started is the excitation force. Okay? Now, I play guitar, a couple other instruments, the string instruments too, 
And this is a real simple example to watch this as well. Now, this in this uh, graphic here, what's happening is you're going to see this person, you can't see it actually happen, but they are pulling their thumb, they're pulling that string, and they're letting it go. That is the excitation force. And then it sets up an oscillation. Watch as we pull it back here. And you'll notice you'll visibly able, be able to visibly see the oscillation going back and forth from one extreme to the other. And you'll notice it's starting to try to find its, its natural point of rest, that center point, okay, as, it's, as the string starts to die down. Okay? So, uh, again, we're, whenever someone's playing a guitar, they are setting that uh, vibration in motion through the force of exc the excitation force. Okay? Another example, just pick strike on the string doing the exact same thing is the excitation force. When you ring a bell, for example, okay, we are striking it and we are setting up a vibration inside the mass of this bell right here and that is an audible sound, just like the guitar string. That vibration is an audible sound and you can hear it, okay? So, just one more example of the excitation force and probably one that you've seen around your house more than once is if you get a load of clothes all lumped into one end of your uh, drum uh, in your washing machine, and sometimes in your drum, but mostly in your washing machine, it will create a heavy spot and it will, uh, it will vibrate one time, so the RPM of that drum spinning in there. And sometimes it can be pretty violent depending on how uh, much weight you've got off-center or une unequally distributed in the drum. So just anyway, that, that's uh, probably something you've seen. Okay, and here's one more example. Uh, in this particular case, we've got a shiv that's got a chunk sort of missing out of it, okay, and or fly weight maybe, and what it's doing is it's in balance and it's causing it to jump up and down. These are, a, uh, again, examples of excitation force. Now, the three forces that oppose the excitation force, we're gonna go into each one of those, okay? First of all, we got dampening. I'm gonna use that guitar, uh, Example again, once we strike that string and we've got that string in motion and it's vibrating and it's putting off an audible sound as a result, okay? Well, we can dampen that by just simply laying our hands in it and we basically cause the string to stop, uh, stop its movement. We have dampened or opposed that, that vibrational force by laying our hand on the string and, and dampening that oscillation motion of the string to the point where it finally stops. We no longer have vibration. We no longer have a tone coming out of the guitar string. Uh, if you play piano, for example, uh, the, the right pedal on the piano, when you press down that pedal and you strike a uh, key on the piano, you get a tone that's sustained. It, it goes on and it's doing exactly what that guitar string is doing. It's vibrating and we're getting a tone, a pitch out of that particular string. And if we let the pedal off, what happens behind the scenes under the piano is a big felt bar comes and lays down on top of all the strings and it dampens the strings and shuts that vibration down, shuts the tone down, and, it'll, and it's no longer sustained. sustained. It'll cut the, the uh, tone right off. But anyway, that's dampening, which is one of the opposing forces to vibration. And here is a, a, a dampener uh, shock mount for uh, an industrial piece of equipment. I've, I've seen these, I've used these before. Sometimes you have like, particularly like hammer mills and other things that just naturally, they kind of shake a lot more than some other pieces of equipment. And you can absorb or dampen, and again, the, the uh, definition of dampening is to lessen the effect of or the impact uh, by using shock mounts, okay, uh, to mount the equipment. You've got a couple of holes in each one of these mounts that mounts to the, uh, the, the base or the, or the frame or the, or the uh, concrete. And then you set the, um, you can sit the machine down on top, and any vibration is sort of the impact of that vibration is lessened through this shock mount. Now, um, I used to uh, work on civilian aircraft and licensed aircraft mechanic, and uh, back in the day, uh, we used to have these instrument panels, and these are panels that are not directly screwed to the or attached to the uh, airframe. Instead, behind each one of these, uh, behind each this, this panel is a shock mount, okay, and, and a screw will come out. Uh, stub will come out this end, and then this end will be mounted to the airframe, and there's, it's, go, it's sandwiched between the instrument panel and the airframe. And that's because the engine naturally vibrates and things like that. And these instruments are very sensitive, so we try to lessen or dampen the shock uh, of the, that the engine uh, and other flight, while in flight too, uh, that it has on these instruments, and particularly the gyroscopes. They're real sensitive, and, um, and so we use these shock mounts here to, to lessen the impact there. But the other opposing force is the mass of an object, okay? Um, the mass is the property 
uh, of a physical body that measures its resistance and is a measure of its resistance to acceleration when there's a force applied, the excitation force applied that we talked about just a second ago. And in this example, I've just got a washer tied to a string, okay? But this washer right here is the mass, okay? And how it responds to my excitation force if I were to thump that and put that into motion, okay? How much it resists that excitation force is dependent on the mass, okay? Uh, going to the opposite end of the uh, spectrum there, uh, compare it to a big heavy boat anchor, okay? If I apply X number of, uh, X amount of um, excitation force to this washer, okay, to put it into motion, that same excitation force, that same amount of excitation force, is going to have very little impact, or not nearly as much impact, uh, as it did on the washer because the mass of a big heavy anchor is so much more, you know? So, I mean, just, I'm just trying to put it into common sense uh, perspective for you. So if I apply a certain amount, it's going to make this move a lot more than this heavy boat anchor as a result of the mass. So the more mass that you have, the more opposing force you have to the excitation and the vibration force, okay? So th th that will uh, damp that and dampening uh, oppose it. And then the last one is the stiffness. And using the, uh, the saw blade example again, okay? So uh, I've got a certain amount of stiffness in this one saw blade, and it, it impacts how much this is going to vibrate, oscillate from uh, point to point. Now, if I had maybe, uh, say, 10 of these, and I braised them all together, and I increased the stiffness, then the, the amount of vibration and the amount of deflection would be a whole lot less because it's a lot stiffer. You know, a common uh, thing around your house is like if you took two or three two-by-fours, and screw them all together, it's going to be much more stiff and be able to, uh, to support much more load than if you just had one. One would probably bow under a certain amount of load, but if you took that same load and you went ahead and, and uh, put two or three two by fours together, strengthen it, and increase the stiffness, it would impose the amount of force that's uh, being laid on that. Same thing with vibration, okay? You increase the stiffness, you increase the mass, uh, and, and you're, um, you're going to uh, less of the impact uh, against the vibration, okay? And so if we took a piece of, you know, we had this mass, this is just like a, like a steel block or something like that, and we suspended it with a string, and we were able to put a, a pencil on this, attach a pencil to this mass, and we ran it across this chart recorder paper, or just, you know, the scrolling paper, then as it went up and down between its points, as during its oscillation and vibration, we would create somewhat of a sine wave for those of you who the electrical classes uh, should look a little familiar. They're, they're, they're similar, but they're also very different as well. So uh, that's what happens, uh, and then we create, this is more a uh, realistic look of it, we create our sine wave here, okay? And this is our oscillation from our point of rest through its, its full travel in one direction, past its point of rest through its full deflection on the other end, back to its point of rest, okay? We call that one cycle. Okay, uh, but that is basically looking at the deflection uh, over a amount of time, and we're going to get much more uh, involved with this with this as we go through. But um, <clears throat> for right now, I want to make these videos short uh, and di digestible. So anyway, that's uh, what I've got for you right now. Okay, be sure to, to uh, watch the next one in this series. But like I said, I'm going to break these up into small chunks, a little bit at a time, and they're going to get much more in depth as we go. But I thought I'd just throw this as an introductory. So anyway, if you got questions, uh, be sure to give me a call, email me, um, or stop by my office, find me in the lab. I'm in the lab on Tuesdays from 6 to 10, so you know, I'm available. If you got any questions or you don't understand anything that we're going through as we go along, by all means, get a hold of me. Thanks for watching, and be sure to watch the next video.